Namaste, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us this evening for another session of Yoga Insights. So this evening's session will feature KPJAYI authorized level two Ashtanga yoga teacher, Taylor Hunt. Um, so Taylor is dedicated to sharing his transformative and healing practice with others by teaching daily Mysore classes at the Ashtanga Yoga Columbus Center and by offering workshops around the world. He's also the author of Away From Darkness, and the director of the Trini Foundation, which is a nonprofit organization dedicated to sharing the life-changing practice of Ashtanga with those suffering from addiction. In this session, Taylor will talk about the transformative nature of yoga and how it took him from living on the streets to teaching yoga worldwide. So let's welcome Taylor this evening. Taylor, would you like to join us? Namaste. Thank Hello. you so much for joining us. Hi, Taylor. How are you? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me on today. Lovely. So I'll see you guys at the end of the session. And thank you again, Taylor Hunt, for being a part of Indica Yoga. Thank you so much. Of course. Um, so I, I just want to give thanks, obviously, to Sophia and Indica um, for having me on. Um, I think that uh, it's important to go around and share the message of hope and that yoga can be transformational for, for people. And I think that a lot of people need it right now. Um, you know, to be completely honest. So um, my ideas around this talk is I'm just going to share a little bit about my story of how I got into it, um, give you a little background of, about myself. Um, she gave you my bio, um, but I'm going to share a little bit about my history and kind of like how I came to yoga. And then I'm also going to share a little bit about the Trini Foundation and and uh, the work that we're doing, and and um, which I think is, is extremely important for um, the United States, but I also think it's really important um, to spread that message around the world as well. And so, um, yes, uh, you know, I started drinking when I was about, uh, fif about 15 years old and, um, I drank to, um, excess really from the first time that I was, um, you know, introduced to it. And I, um, you know, I, I never really fit in as a kid. And I always like uh, struggled with like social interactions and, you know, maybe having social anxiety and things like that. And uh, when alcohol was like brought into my life, um, which, you know, obviously was a curse at, at one point, um, but in the beginning, it felt like it was um, something that was really helping me and uh, it helped me cope with like the daily living and gave me some hope um, that I could like kind of put down like my uh, stuff that I had that kind of got in the way of like relationships and and uh, sort of like phobias around relationships and stuff like that and uh, was able to put it down problem is is I just couldn't stop um, and so just to fast forward and for the sake of this you know call it started when I was like 15 or 16 but it took me until I was about 25 or 26 before I actually got sober and, um, you know, sobriety is a really hard thing. Um, recovery is a really hard thing. Um, most, most of the time, too, people think that it's a morality thing, like you should just make better decisions. And, you know, the doctors and psychiatrists and all of these people um, obviously know that it, it is way more than just a morality thing. Um, it is actually a disease. And the disease is cunning, baffling, and powerful. And then also, like, it is uh, basically trying to, trying to kill you. Um, so when I drink alcohol, what happens is, is I have an allergy and the allergy like creates this craving. And as I crave it, um, I want more and more of it and I will do it until like I die, um, essentially. So I went into treatment center um, four times. And on the fourth one, um, I remember like uh, my ex-wife, like uh, grabbing me um, from, uh, you know, like living on the streets. Uh, she found me in a house. And she took me back to a treatment center and they strapped me to the gurney and they took me upstairs and I was like in a private, private room in the hospital. And this is hard to share, to be honest with you, but I want to, I want to share what addiction looks like and, and also that there's hope and that yoga can transform your life. And so just bear with me for a second. And so they strapped me down to the bed, like a five point restraint, because if they wouldn't have, I wouldn't have stayed um, because it's quite painful to, you know, come off of heroin and alcohol and drugs and all this, all this stuff that I had in my system. It's quite difficult to, to come off of that stuff. And uh, they strapped me to the bed. And for three days, um, you know, like I was fed, um, they, they fed me, but they kept me on the bed. 
And um, I sat there and I, I actually never want to forget this moment where it was so much pain being withdrawn from like these, the, the drugs, like I didn't take any medicine to get me off of the drugs that I was taking. And um, I sat on the gurney and just kind of sweat and shook and just like was in agony um, as I was being detoxed from this drugs. And usually it takes about three days for um, some of the drugs to get out of your system. And, and so I sat there for three days. And on the third day, they took me down to the cafeteria. And this is my last time through treatment center. And they took me down to the ca cafeteria. And uh, it was the first time that I had a real meal. And, um, you know, I hadn't, hadn't really been eating for, um, I don't know, maybe six months before, just eating sugar and, you know, like uh, sweets and things like that, never really having a real meal. And I was also like very skinny. Um, if anyone knows me on here or um, has seen social media, like I'm tall and skinny. Um, but I was even skinnier back then. <clears throat> Excuse me. And so I, um, you know, I was really struggling at that point. And um, I was lucky to be alive and like really have a second chance. I ate the meal. And I remember I immediately felt like nourished. And I felt like I was, um, you know, I felt good on the inside from, from eating. Well, after eating, I went back upstairs uh, to my room. And I remember... I'm getting ready to go to sleep. And I remember dropping to my knees and I re remember saying like, you know, God, if you can get me out of this one, um, I'm willing to do whatever it takes in order to get sober, um, which is a theme that um, is still in my life. I mean, it's still one of the things that, um, you know, like I, I say on a consistent basis, like show me what I'm supposed to do with my life. So um, I went, went to sleep. And it was first time for a really long time, if you're doing the amount of drugs that I was doing, like um, that I was actually able to get eight hours of sleep, which was like a miracle. And I woke up, and I remember I said these words, like out loud, like, I want to live again. And what that meant is, is that I had to do all of this other work. And I started going to 12-step uh, meetings. Um, I got a sponsor. I, uh, you know, all this again, all of this stuff is like difficult to talk about because there's a lot of shame, guilt, and remorse that goes along with, um, you know, the disease of alcoholism and drug addiction for sure. And so I, um, you know, I was like, I want to live again. And, and it meant that I did all of these things. I, I worked the 12 step recovery, uh, program. Um, I got the sponsor, I went to meetings, you know, which at first I thought the meetings were stupid. And then it, what I realized is that the meetings were actually saving my life. And, you know, just to put it into yoga context, um, too, is that uh, the same way you work the steps is the same way that you uh, work the yoga sutras. Um, you know, just for example, like, you know, all of the 12 steps are one liners, they're one sentence, uh, just like how the yoga sutras are. And so, and you don't just read the yoga sutras and say like, check, I'm done with it. You know, like, oh, okay, great. That, that's a great saying, or that's a great one liner, uh, that kind of stuff. You just don't do that. Um, how you work the steps and how you work the sutras is the same way. You find someone who can help you, like a teacher or sponsor. Um, you journal about it. You figure out how to apply it to your life. You figure out how this is uh, important to you, um, how, how to apply it, how to process it, all of these kind of things. And, and I was doing that. And um, I, I, I worked all the way through the steps. And I, I made it to the 11th step. And I was about six months sober. And, um, and this is like a really important story in my life uh, because it, this is how I got introduced to yoga. So I, um, I made it to the 11th step and I don't expect anyone to know what that is. Um, so I'll explain it. So the 11th step is sought through prayer and meditation to improve our conscious contact with God. That's what the step is. And so like, again, you have to process it. You got to journal about it. You got to read some resources, talk to your sponsor, talk to, talk to people about it all that kind of stuff. And um, I was in the process of doing that. Like I, I really was like in the process of, of doing that. And I remember like coming to prayer and saying like, I know how to pray. Um, just shared a little bit about how I was, uh, you know, praying. Like I want to live again, like show me what I'm supposed to do. Um, so I knew how to pray and I had a God of my understanding. And um, which is also like a, you know, sort of like a universal truth that is in the Yoga Sutras. Um, Ishvara Devata, which, you know, basically God of your choosing or understanding, uh, which is the same language that is in the 12 steps, which I think is fascinating. So, um, but I didn't know what meditation was. 
And so like I was, you know, like kind of going through this whole process of understanding what meditation was and talking to my sponsor and all this stuff. And he said something that, I mean, you know, basically pivoted my life. And he said, well, why don't you pray about getting some uh, guidance or understanding around what meditation is since you already know how to pray. And I was like, great, that's easy. No problem. I can do that. So like that night, I remember like going to, um, you know, uh, going to my room and, and getting on my knees and saying like, you know, just show me what meditation is. Like, show me how to work this step. And uh, the next morning I woke up and I went to um, a 12 step meeting and I was sitting in a circle uh, with about, I don't know, 50 other people. And there was this lady on the other side and, um, and I could tell like throughout the entire meeting, every time that I made eye contact with her, she came to me and she was like, um, you, you know, like she, she looked like she wanted to talk to me. And so at the end of the meeting, she came up to me and she said, um, she said, I think I'm supposed to teach you yoga. And my response was that I think yoga is for girls and I'm not really in, into it. Uh, that was my first initial reaction. Um, and I'm just being transparent. Like that's where I was at that time. And, and there is a lot of women in yoga, but there's also a lot of men um, that are practicing. Um, nowadays, like it's, you know, it doesn't matter. Um, and it didn't matter back then, but it kind of like threatened my masculinity uh, because I, I did think it was only for girls. And and I thought it was more like an aerobics class um, instead of it being like a, or an exercise class, instead of it actually being like something that could help me spiritually, mentally, physically. Um, I thought it was only the physical thing. And so I wasn't into it. I, I like kind of shoot her away. And I was like, I also remember saying, which, you know, it was like kind of forward that she said that to me. I said, why or who told you that? you know, like you're supposed to teach me yoga because she said, I think I'm supposed to teach you, which sort of implied that someone else was like kind of giving her information. So um, I thought maybe my sponsor or something like that. And she's like, no, I just have a gut feeling that I'm supposed to teach you. Well, you know, anytime that I'm in my life and um, a lesson needs to like come through, um, I'm, I'm quite stubborn or can be quite stubborn. And um, sometimes the message just has to be repeated over and over and over again. You know, and, and I could say like my higher power, um, you know, it has like a sense of humor and the sense of humor uh, is really like over the next two days, I saw this woman six times. Um, I saw her at the supermarket and I uh, turned down the Italian aisle um, in Columbus, Ohio, and she was standing right there. And I was like trying to go get pasta and like make dinner. And, um, and she looked at me and she's like, oh, this is so weird, like that we're seeing each other again. And I was like, yeah, it is weird. She said, I think I'm supposed to teach you yoga. Like you should join my class. <laughs> so uh, next thing I was like, okay, like this is kind of creepy. Um, I, I went back to my house, walking my dog. This is maybe like an hour, maybe two hours later. She's walking down the other side of the street and she's walking a dog in our neighborhood and she's house sitting for someone. She said, you know, she from across the street, she said, this is so weird. Like, you know, I can't believe we've seen each other three times in one day. And um, <laughs> she said, uh, I think I'm supposed to teach you yoga. And I was like, no, thanks. And I like, kind of ran away. Well, just long story short, um, I got to a, a place where um, I went, went home, went to bed, did all like made dinner woke up the next morning, I went to a meeting and um, there was only one seat left in the whole place. And um, it was right next to me. I, I don't know why that seat was open. You could call it coincidence, I don't know. And so I, uh, I, we start the meeting, everyone's, you know, talking and, you know, like they're kind of like doing the, the initial, you know, um, kind of invocation kind of things. And so uh, the door opens and it's the lady. And this had been the fourth time that I saw her. And this was like my meeting. This is a meeting I went to. I've never seen her there. Um, but she comes and sits right next to me and she whispers in my ear. She says, uh, I think I'm supposed to teach you yoga. Like, this is we really weird that I keep uh, keep seeing you. And I was like, this is totally creepy. And I, I like ran out of the place after the meeting. I didn't want to talk to her. So I, um, the next thing is I went to pump gas later in uh, later in the day into my car because um, I was running some errands. And I remember saying in my head um, that there was a person 
across the pump that was whistling. And as she was whistling, um, I was I was like, oh, this person is really happy. I was like, wonder what this person's on, you know, like what what uh, you know they're on a, a good vibe kind of thing. And I looked over at the other side of the pump, and it was the lady again. And she said, I think this is like a sign. I, I'm supposed to teach you yoga. And I was like, I, I I mean, excuse my language, but I I was like, I will do your damn yoga class. I will I'll do your damn yoga class. And um, I remember calling my sponsor and he said something that I feel like would change my life. And in the fact that, you know, he, he looked at me and he said, like, isn't like, isn't yoga meditation. I, w- I was talking about like how, you know, this lady was like bothering me and she wanted to teach me yoga. And he's like, you're not paying attention. He said, you asked for guidance and you got guidance. And, you know, like, I think that you have to go and practice yoga with this lady, even though I was complaining about it. And so like, it was like uh, this moment where I wasn't paying attention to the signs that were in front of me, you know, like I was just like looking at it and I was looking through my own kind of stuff where I was like, oh, I can't do that. Like, that's, you know, that, like, that's not what a man looks like. That's, you know, that's not like what I'm supposed to be doing kind of thing. And uh, he's like, he said to me, he's like, yoga's meditation. And he hung up the phone on me and he said, like, you're going to class and hung up the phone. And I went to the, uh, the store, I bought a mat. Um, I didn't have much money um, because I was basically like kind of on my own, not, not a good job, all that kind of stuff. And so I went to that class and it was just a couple of days later and um, I showed up and it was all women, which isn't really a problem. I mean, it's not a problem, but um, the reason why it was a problem during that time is that I didn't want to make a fool out of myself. And, um, you know, I remember like going to this place where I was like, ah, competition, you know, like I'm going to beat these women at, at yoga. And it's like, well, yoga is not about competition. Yeah. It's like, uh, so I was like kind of dealing with that, um, as well. I was like, I'm going to win today. And, and what happens is like, if you walk into yoga and you try and win, there's always someone that's better than you. Um, there's always someone who's like a little bit more advanced. And on that day, I was the worst in the room. I couldn't touch my toes. Um, I didn't have the right gear. I didn't really buy the right mat. Um, I wanted to wear my socks. I had these big, long basketball shorts on. Um, I was out of shape, you know, like um, my arms still hurt from, you know, putting needles in my arms and my liver still hurt from the amount of uh, painkillers and alcohol that I was drinking. You know, I was really like rehabbing myself and six months sober is not very sober, folks. It's not. So I, um, I, you know, we did the class and we did Ashtanga yoga. I've never done any other style. So like I'm an authorized level two teacher um, today. And, and uh, I started with this style and I continue to do this style today. And I think that the really important thing to, to mention is, is that um, the first, first day it didn't work for me. Um, it, it didn't work. And the reason why it didn't work is because I had so many insecurities around it. And I was anxious because I didn't know what I was supposed to be doing. And really like the beauty of Ashtanga yoga is that you end up doing a practice that is yours. Um, And as you learn the sequence, um, as you learn this stuff, like you, you get deeper into it. Um, Unlike other yoga styles, which change the sequence every day, or depending on what the teacher is um, trying to get you to, to do that day. Um, that's not how Ashtanga yoga works. And so like on the first day, like I didn't know the logistics of the class and um, we did maybe half of the practice. Um, we did all the way to Navasana, like sort of abbreviated, which is 30 pushups for the record, um, your vinyasas. And we did headstand and shoulder stand. We did back bends. We did all of these things that are like quite difficult, which I probably wouldn't do to a beginner, but it, for some reason, you know, like, um, it didn't bother my journey, um, that I learned that much that, that fast on the first day, but it brought up a lot of feelings of insecurities. You know, uh, one thing that I know that is true, and I've heard in a bunch of spiritual texts, like we are free to make whatever decisions that we want to make, like we're free to make them, and, but we're not free of the consequences of those actions. Um, we're not. Um, and so what happens is, is that, um, you know, like as I'm practicing yoga, like I really felt on that first day. I felt the consequences of my actions. It was the first time that I actually felt it. And, um, and I felt it in my body. I couldn't do a push up, couldn't fold forward. I noticed that I didn't treat myself well. I didn't speak to myself well. Um, 
you know, I noticed that I, I, I couldn't do a push up. I mean, because of like all the things I mentioned before, and I could barely breathe um, because I, you know, smoked cigarettes and, you know, I was just living rough, um, if you can't tell. So, so I went through all of that stuff and I felt the consequence of my actions. I realized that really, like, I wasn't an advocate for myself. I was, I actually hated myself um, just based off of like my behavior um, of how I treated, treated myself. And so, you know, I got done with the class and I laid down for Shavasana or just taking a rest. And I, I laid down there. And as I laid down, I remember like angry tears came up. Um, and, and it was, I mean, it was moving, but it, I felt vulnerable. And that wasn't something that was comfortable to me at that moment. Um, it wasn't something that I felt like was okay in that moment. I, and I got these like tears and I sat there in Shavasana. I just got angrier and angrier and I wanted to stuff the feelings. And so like she called us out of Shavasana, I ran out of the room. Like I ran out and I, I was like, I'm never coming back to yoga because of how it made me feel. So, um, and I remember like going to the, um, like a fast food place and like getting a bunch of food and just like stuff in my face and then watching TV the rest of the day, because I didn't want to feel the way that I felt, you know, I didn't want to feel like that. I actually hated myself and I never really treated myself good. And I, I was like, I would like resign that day. I was like, I'm not going back to yoga it's not happening. And, you know, like when that kind of stuff comes up, especially because I felt vulnerable, like I called like my support people and I called my sponsor again. And I said, you know, like it brought up all of these feelings of insecurity, made me feel like uh, that I hated myself, you know, like uh, I couldn't touch my toes, all this stuff. And he said, you know, like Taylor, here's what I know for certain. He said, you asked for this thing, you prayed for, for it to get guidance. And now the universe um, is, or God is like, uh, pulling you in that direction. And he's like, I don't think you will stay sober if you don't do yoga. And, um, which was, I don't know, kind of alarming. And the reason why it was alarming is because, um, you know, I thought I was just going to be able to do the 12 steps and, you know, like go to therapy and that kind of stuff to like help, my, help and treat my drug addiction and, and alcoholism. But, what my sponsor was saying at that time was that yoga was also going to be the thing that helped uh, transform my life, um, which was a radical new idea. So I was like, all right, I'll go back to the second class. And um, I would say like, this is where the, the miracle happened for me. I um, went back to the second class. And as I explained, like the Shanga method is like, you do the same thing, um, you know, the next time. And so I went in there and I had less anxiety. And also, like, since I got my, uh, like, butt beat from the, the women in there, um, since I made it into a competition thing, and I definitely lost that day, um, I said to myself, it's not about a competition. I'm just going to try and be better than I was the day before. And I remembered what we were supposed to be doing. And I don't know if I actually got better, but, uh, but I do know that, because uh, practice makes perfect kind of thing. But uh, I do know that I felt way more at ease as I walked into the class. There was less anxiety. I felt better in my own skin, like that kind of stuff. We did the exact same practice. Uh, we made it through the whole thing, did the same amount of vinyasas, did headstand, did shoulder stand, and you know, did all of, all of these things that I still wasn't good at, still couldn't touch my toes kind of thing. And uh, we laid down for Shavasana again. And um, I remember having tears come in my eyes again. Um, and this was maybe like one of the most moving, you know, the first class, like made me feel vulnerable and made me feel like, um, you know, that I wasn't really a, a you know, friend of myself and all that kind of stuff. But the second class was, was different because like maybe my anxiety was at a different level and I practiced and laid down and I sat there and was just breathing and I was just like soaking it up. It was like the first time that I ever felt like I did something healthy for myself. Um, you know, I, st I, I had tears in my eyes again. And, you know, the teacher obviously can see this kind of stuff. And, and I think that, you know, she knew. Obviously, she was a person in recovery as well. And she like knew how the layers could be shed and those kind of things. And, and that happened on the first day. Uh, or excuse me, the second second time I practiced, the second day. 
And so sat there and I remember usually I tell people like, hey, a little bird whispered in my ear. But I mean, the fact of the matter is I don't know where the sound came from, but like it was like someone whispered in my ear um, because it wasn't like one of my thought. It came in my ear and it literally like left like someone and said it in my ear and it said, you're perfect just the way you are. And man, I busted into tears and uh, just gave me chills, actually, um, just to say it, because like I can still feel that feeling. It's part of the reason why I continue to practice today. Um, and so I laid there and it was the first time I felt some sort of compassion for myself. Um, it was the first time that I felt like I did something healthy um, as well. It, it, it felt like I was comfortable in my own skin. I felt like I shed some layers. I got rid of anxiety. I, I didn't feel sad. I felt empowered, you know, um, and I sat there and I just like soaked it up. And I, I, re I also remember saying like the grass is green on my side of the street today. And um, which is, you know, saying that a lot of times like you hear getting thrown around. But I, I think that on that day, like I wanted to be me. And it was the first time in my life that um, I wanted to be me. Uh, most of the time I looked at other people and I said, like, I wanted what they had or, um, you know, the situations that they had or the job they had or the girlfriend or wife they had, those kind of things. And I never really wanted to be me. Um, and you could I, I could also tell you, like, there's points in my life where I didn't want to be here anymore. And this was a period of time because of like the yoga that I just practiced. I was empowered and I was like, man, I want to live. You know, like, and this is maybe like the first day of my actual life, um, to be honest. So I, um, I rolled over, I looked at the lady with tears in my eyes and I said, like, how do we do this every day? And she said, uh, you know, come with me, I'll show you, um, you know, I will, uh, I'll practice with you. I'll teach you everything I know. And, and she was just like kind of getting started as a teacher. Um, as well. And so she, but she was firmly committed into her practice. So um, yeah. And, and from that day, I continued to practice yoga. Like I showed up every day, you know, I, I continued to, um, I continue to do the things. And, and what I realized is like, you know, practice does make perfect. I continue to show up and I got better at it. Never thought I was going to do this thing and I'm able to do it today. I never thought I was going to make it past primary series and primary series is like the first series of Ashtanga yoga. And um, I've made it all the way to the end of third series, uh, which is huge amount of progress. And also like a huge amount of dedication for anyone, not just myself who makes it there. Um, you know, it takes life changes. It takes dealing with your traumas, it takes dealing with, you know, a lot of these things that uh, not everyone's willing to do that work um, just to be real. So um, just to, fast forward a little bit um i had I had a couple of miracles like happen in the beginning and i just want to like kind of give thanks because like uh, i was in search of a teacher after a certain amount of time that lady was just like basically like my yoga mom um showing me stuff and we reached a certain spot where um or i reached a certain spot where i needed someone to actually guide me and this little miracle um came in and the lady said to me, there's this, there's this woman who's moving into my house who is from Columbus, Ohio, but she's getting ready to move to Sweden. And I was like, okay, cool. Like, and she, and I was like, what's her name? And, and she said, well, her name is LaRuga, LaRuga Glazer. And uh, if anyone knows LaRuga Glazer, like, I mean, she has like maybe one of the best yoga practices and she was kind of like learning to teach back then and and uh she was going to Mysore and and she was like basically just getting back from, from Mysore and she was staying at my yoga mom's house and she taught me privately for about six or eight months and LaRuga was like my first teacher and that's like a real miracle because you know she travels around the world uh, she does a lot of things that I do uh today but she's she's doing it um just in Europe um and I'm doing it more in the United States and and so I, um, I, I had this blessing show up like a teacher, the teacher showed up when the student was ready. And um, I got to learn from her from a really long time. And, and when um, she went to Sweden, I had this other authorized teacher, his name's Matthew Darling, come into my life because I went and visited him in, in Michigan. And, um, and this is like pretty pivotal for me as well, because like, this is how I got to India I um I got I was practicing with Matthew for a really long time uh, a couple of years and he said to me like hey Taylor you need to go drink from the well 
And I was like, yeah, I need to drink from this well. Like, what is this well? And he said, you got to go to, you got to go to Mysore. And I was like, okay. Um, like, I'm willing to go to Mysore. Like, I'll do that. Like, that sounds amazing, actually. And uh, he said, you got to go and you got to practice and all this stuff. And Patabi Joyce had died at this point. And, um, and Sherat was coming to New York and I went to New York and I met Sherat and he, I spent some time with him there. And then I made my first trip to India because of like the suggestion of Matthew Darling. So LaRuga like kind of moved on and she was just in Europe and I was just exclusively studying with like Matthew Darling. And, and as soon as like two years around the two year mark, I went to India and, and, um, I did my first trip. It was like two months long. And I sat there and I, I studied and soaked it up and practiced. And it, man, it was like one of the best times of my life. And I went back home and I sold all my stuff. And um, we came back and I, I was um, talking to my wife and, and I was like, we all need to go. And I had a daughter at the time and, and we sold all of our stuff, our house, our, our cars, um, all of our belongings, uh, moved a little bit of stuff into like uh, Jessica, my wife's uh, parents' house. And we went right back to India for four months, I think, um, or close to four months. And it was uh, 2010 um, or the end of 2010, 2011, something like that. And uh, we spent the four months over there. And it, man, it was like one of the most transformative uh, periods of my life. And as soon as I have four months got up, I went back to um, Ohio and I started a Mysore program um, and, you know, like it really started taking off and I wanted to go back to India again because I thought there was a potential like for maybe for me to get authorized. And so then I, I went back to India for another three months and um, stayed there with my whole family. And this was the, the third time I'd been there and, and the Shala was like sort of overrun with a lot of people. And I remember like Shrat, uh, Shrat's son, Shambhav and my daughter were like playing together. They were like playing with the cricket bats and stuff like that. And um, I said to Shrat, I said, like, you know, you're super busy. Like they messed up reg registration. There was like 700 people instead of 300 or 400 people or something like that. And I said, if you need an assistant, I'm happy to help you. And we had basically formed a relationship um, up to that point. And he said no to me. And I was like, OK, like no big deal. Uh, he rejected it. And this is like the story of how to get how I got authorized and really like helps set up the, you know, um, next period of my life. So um, he said no, but the next day as I stood up from my back bend, he stood in front of me and he said like you're teaching um, or assisting at, at 430 in the morning tomorrow. And I was like, I mean, it's a huge honor. And this is like before there was like actual a lot of assistance, you know, so it was just like me and him and one other person. And we would do it for like three or four hours. And I was exhausted from doing it, but I was grateful that I was doing it because like what it meant was, you know, from the person that I was describing before to the person like who was assisting in the shala, like, I mean, that's change. Like that is the transformation. Um, that's the cool stuff. And so I, um, you know, at the end of the month, which I did it for, I think for six weeks, um, cause I was there for quite a long time and there was like a little lap or like a little crossover there. And so I think I did it for six weeks, about a month and a half. And um, he said to me, I need to see you in an office. And he took this piece of paper and he slid it across the desk. And I looked at it and said, authorized level two teacher. And he said, I want you to fill that out. He said, congratulations, like you're one of my teachers now. And that was maybe one of the most pivotal things that happened in my life because it shaped what I was, what I was doing next. I still had a corporate job. Um, I was getting time off for India and like finding other jobs and stuff like that. But like, once I got authorized, like I became sort of empowered, like my yoga classes got busier. Um, I became like one of, at that time, I think there was maybe only 70 teachers in the U S that were like level two teachers. And so I was just sitting there and, and I was just like in awe. And I, he also said like, Hey, you know what? You did a really good job over this month too, um, of just like supporting him and, and uh, supporting the students. And, and so like, I feel like, felt like I really showed up in like a really positive way and getting authorized. I remember running home. Like I literally like ran home because I showed my wife and I just had tears in my eyes because it wasn't necessarily the piece of paper. It was the amount of transformation it took in order for me to get there. And, um, and I looked at my wife and I, and we're crying. I said, like, I need to write a, write a book. And 
she was like, yeah, you do. And, and for the next year, uh, before we went to India again, I sat down at the computer um, and with the help of another person and I wrote out my book. Um, I, like, I did a lot of dictation um, speech to, to writing um, so I didn't have to type so much, but you know, I, I just sat down and like did the book over and over and over again, spent hours on it, like putting it together. And by the end of the year, we were at the final draft, like the next time I was in India, which is about a year later. And I remember like reading it as objectively as I can. And we're like putting it into publish and we're giving Sherrod a manuscript because he was in it and all this kind of stuff. And I'd spent a lot of time in Mysore at this point, like, you know, like we're talking about almost a year um, of cumulative time uh, spent there where a lot of times nowadays, like people will go for one month, uh, three trips for one month. Like I'd, I'd spent a whole year collectively um, over there at that point. And so I had a relationship and I remember taking the manuscript to Sherat and saying like, hey, can you read this? And he's like, I don't need to read it. He said, I trust you, you know, like I know that you're not gonna say anything bad about me or any of that kind of stuff. He actually didn't say that, but like, he just said, I trust you and slid the manuscript back. And he said like, write whatever you want. And I was like, whoa, like, this is crazy. Um, and so, and I was reading it this last time and I was nervous to put it out. Like, you know, who wants to tell everyone about their drug addiction and who wants to, you know, all this kind of stuff, but this shaped the next part of my life. And, you know, and if you would ask me, like when I was first getting sober, like if I'd be a yoga teacher, I'd tell you, no, I mean, even maybe today, if you said like, oh, you're a yoga teacher, I'd probably say like, no, I'm actually more than that. You know, that's just like one aspect of what I'm doing uh, today. So I, um, yeah, I, I, I read this, read this thing the last time we were getting done with the last edits. I had a cover made. I you know, was paying people to edit it. I've read it for the last time and I'm sitting in this, you know, in my sore and I'm reading it and scratching stuff off. And I looked over at my wife and I said, I think we need to start a charity. And she said, what do you mean? I, I said, like, I think we need to start a charity. And, um, we need to teach yoga uh, or people in, in addiction yoga in early stages of their recovery. And we also need to provide scholarships for people. And um, at, on that day, we filed a, uh, like we started a business um, with the state of Ohio. And then we also, we became incorporated. And then we also applied for IRS um, designation as a 501c3 charity. Um, which is a tax exempt status in the United States, which means that you don't pay taxes. And uh, the people who donate to you uh, get a um, like a break on their taxes as a result of um, of donating. Um, so it's one of the benefits of donating because uh, they can offset their taxes. So I um, so we applied for all of this stuff and we got this we got the designation from the irs in our uh, state of ohio like immediately and so we created a website and we put it all together with the help of some other people and uh, I, I i released my book a few months later and uh, the cool thing about it was is that uh, i was scared to do it but you know for a couple of weeks it wasn't like a amazon bestseller or new york, new york time bestseller but for a couple of weeks, it was like sort of an Amazon hot seller of the week. And um, and when I released it, which was like around uh, February or March of 2016, um, they could show you sort of what um, or how many people were, were looking at it at that moment. And I'm sure the analytics are even better today. But um, I logged on. To, uh, to my computer to look to see how many pe people were reading it because I was just like interested. And there was 9,000 pages being read at that moment. And um, I don't know if that meant like 9,000 people or what it, what it meant, but like it got some serious traction and it was well-received from the Ashtanga community and yoga community. And it was well-received from the recovery community um, throughout the United States. And, and uh, it really catapulted my, my career because, you know, like as Ashtanga teachers, like we teach a lot of the same things. Um, but the, the real difference in some of the things that I'm able to teach is I'm able to give this experience and not everyone has like this dramatic of, of experience as what I have and, um, and they don't have to, uh, and, and more power to them. 
um, it's better not to have this kind of story um, that got you into yoga, but it's it's been very transformative for me. And so like, as I released this book, I also had this charity and, and like the book took off my, my workshop teaching took off because there's a lot of people that are struggling with this even more so today. Maybe these last statistic I heard is like, uh, because of the pandemic, uh, addiction is up 5,000%. And I don't even know what that looks like. I mean, that 5,000%, like, what does that number even mean? Um, I just know that about 50,000 people a year are dying in the United States because of drug overdoses. Um, which is more than cancer, um, heart attacks, um, breast cancer, um, automobile accidents. Um, it's more than all of those. So, uh, you know, I spent this time doing this, um, you know, putting all of this together. And um, I felt really supported in my journey um, that I was able to do this. And I was still practicing. I was still teaching. I was still doing all of the things that I needed to do, still going back to, to Mysore. But, um, you know, I really started like kind of moving in the direction of like really working for the the Trini Foundation and the Trini Foundation, you know, like I said, it's a 501c3 and and we do three things and uh, it's been really pivotal um, for a lot of people, you know, like, so we, we have about 50 um, at one point, maybe we had hundred, but so in between 50 and a hundred um, yoga teachers that uh, go into treatment centers around the world, um, not just in the United States, it's actually around the world now. Um, and we're trying, we're, our foothold is in Columbus, Ohio. And um, they go in and they teach Ashtanga yoga and they teach it the way that I was taught it, um, but in a slower fashion, um, we teach it very traditionally. Um, we do make modifications and sometimes exit out of poses depending on their abilities, but we really try and like hone into like making sure that they understand what the yoga practice is and what it can do for them. And a teacher goes in, we pay every teacher um, to go in and teach these classes because teachers are important, just like sponsors, just like gurus, like um, they're important. And so we pay the teachers so that their uh, time is valued. And then we also have a scholarship program. So those teachers like go into the classes and as they go into the classes, like they um, they basically like say, hey, there's a scholarship program. And throughout the United States, we have hundreds of scholarships at any given time. And so, and it, you know, goes up and down. Sometimes it's 50 and other times it's 200. And, you know, like I think year to date, like we've done several hundred scholarships for people. And, and every year we raise about, I don't know, close to $100,000 in order to um, just get people access to yoga at early stages of the recovery. And um, the last thing that we do, um, which is a relatively like new project for us, but um, something that is very needed is that we realize that, you know, yoga is great and mindfulness is great. Um, and we're still like really working on those programs. But the other thing that we're, we're really kind of dialed into is making sure that people have stable housing um, because a lot of people cannot get sober because they don't have a car. They don't have a way to the yoga studio. They don't have a house. They don't have basic needs met. And so um, Trini Foundation recently moved into recovery housing and, and we're in the process of opening up a men's house. But currently right now we have a women's house and my wife is like really uh, the head of this project. And we've been raising a lot of money and and we also i mean we need help from individuals just like yourself regardless of whether you're in india or asia or any of this kind of stuff like you have the ability to like really fast track someone into learning yoga and mindfulness but also providing a a, a stable house for them and man that's like uh one of the most pivotal things i've been calling people left and right because like you know a lot of the women that are showing up at our houses are um, women that don't have clothes that don't have um, don't have food, they don't have medicine, uh, things like that. And we're really asking for donations, like asking people to be heroes and like saving people's lives. And if you don't have a if you don't have a home, um, I was lucky I had a house. You know, I had like this. Uh, you know, I had some basic needs met. So, um, you know, like we're not not everyone's that lucky, but if you don't have those things, it's very hard to you know, to get sober. And so like this next part of my life that I transitioned to after the book, and I still teach, I teach daily, um, yoga studios right behind me, actually. Um, they're having another class. That's why I'm in my car. But um, so, you know, I still teach daily. I teach my sort classes. I still make trips to India. I've been there uh, 10 or 11 times, something like that. 
And, um, you know, I continue to go back because like it inspires me and like fills up my cup and really gives me like uh, uh, joy. And, and also like I'm of service of Shrat. Shrat is an honorary director of the foundation. He's helped us raise money. Um, he's helped us create uh, a training, a teacher training program for people who are um, learning how to teach in those treatment settings, um, which is really trauma informed and smart Ashtanga. Um, a lot of times what I call it. Um, and so, uh, and so I continue to do those things. And I, I also travel around and after my book, you know, like I've been able to raise a lot of money, but I've also been able to like push people into the direction of like looking at their life and saying, you know, how do I make that next step, that next hard step of like uh, change. And uh, what I've found is that the more I get into my yoga practice, I, I, I think that it's sort of law of karma when it comes to practice. And, and also I've seen this work in many people's lives, like the more that you give to it, the more that you give back or that you get back. And, um, and over the period of, of this time, like I've like devoted my whole life that what I'm sharing with you today is like, you know, how I got sore, like how I got sober. And, and then also like the great work of my life, you know, like to be of service to another human being, or, or even just to donate, you know, time or energy to like this cause. Like, I know that the yoga uh, practice is powerful and I'm like shouting it from the rooftops. Um, but to get people into it and, you know, to find heroes that are able to support this journey for other people is, is like really important. Um, you know, when I first started yoga and I started feeling the benefits, I remember telling every single person, like I would say, like, it's so important. It's so important. Like, you got to do it. 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 And I reached a spot. And this is, I think, uh, I don't know, kind of funny. Um, I reached a spot where research today actually says that yoga works for anxiety, depression, mental health, addiction, all of these other things. In the beginning, it was just my experience, but now there's actually research and papers and all of this stuff, mindfulness and yoga and all of these things that um, that help people who are dealing with the things that I'm mentioning here. And so uh, it's it's actually proven now, um, which I've been around long enough that, you know, I, I saw a thing. I saw how it worked for me, but I also saw like that there was this. Um, research and there's money being put behind it. Like I know the the veterans here in uh, the United States, like we because of PTSD, it works for PTSD. Um, we are spending billions of dollars to teach the veterans like how to practice yoga and how to breathe. Um, and they're also doing the same thing with uh, addiction and things. So, you know, yeah. So it, it's really kind of amazing to kind of see like you know from a person who lived on the streets, um, you know to showing up and getting authorized all the way to like, how can I be a maximum service to the community around me? And how can I show them, you know, yoga and how can I help provide housing in a supportive neighborhood, um, you know, somewhere where they can uh, thrive and grow. And man, you know, for all of you out there that are listening to this or, or will be listening to this, like, you know, you have a real opportunity. If you're inspired by yoga, you know, like you could teach yoga classes, you can make a donation. You could, um, you know, like be a, a volunteer for the, you know, the Trinity Foundation, because if it inspires you the way that it inspires me, um, you know, like it is endless, the amount of people that need this, um, that need access to it. And that's what I'm trying to do today, you know, and, and like I said, this is the great work of my life. So, yeah. So, um I'll give us uh, some time and for some questions or any uh, any thoughts or any of that kind of stuff. Uh, maybe I can invite uh, Sophia back on. Namaste, everyone. Thank you so much, Dila. That was so, so inspiring. Of course, I've done an interview with you and I've worked with you, collaborated in the past. So I know the story, but I think it's such an important story to share because it's still such a taboo topic that a lot of people hesitate to talk about and don't necessarily acknowledge or want to seek help for something like this. So I think it's so important to talk about these things. So th that really encourages people to talk about it also and then make the necessary changes. You know, and like totally. your experience. 
beautifully like yoga is one of the it's one of the most positive ways of using it because that's pretty much what it's for for healing and nurturing and transformation so yeah um we're open for questions now so if anyone has questions please let us know meanwhile if anyone would like to find out about more about taylor's work and also if you guys would like to get in touch with the trini foundation and help taylor do this wonderful work taylor can you share the details please and we'll put it in our chat box koti ji can you yeah. please make this accessible to everyone yeah, so uh, the best way to get a hold of the Trini Foundation is really just to go onto our website. And the website is T-R-I-N-I foundation.org. And uh, it should pop up immediately if you're typing it into Google. And, and um, there's, a, there's a place where you apply uh, for scholarship. There's also a, a place to donate at the top. And then it also goes over all of our services. And you can also find us on, um, you know, Instagram at Trini Foundation. We're getting ready to host a challenge, Kino McGregor, and dollars, uh, so that we can, um, you know, basically like she's trying to help us hundred thousand dollars to help with the women's house. And um, it's been really cool. So if you wanted to join our challenge, you're more than welcome to. Thank you so much. And I think we seem to have a question. This question is coming from Alia Husseini, who's saying, does yoga help with eating disorders? And if yes, does it matter if it's practiced in the morning or the afternoon? Uh, I mean, yes, of course. I, the only difference between like a, addiction, like what I was talking about, and also like, you know, with uh, eating disorders is that you have to continue to eat. Um, and so like I'm abstaining from drugs and alcohol. Um, and so like those, those people need to figure out how to, um, have healthy eating habits, but it can 100% help. Um, the 12 steps of recovery can definitely help. And then also like, um, it doesn't matter if it's practiced in the morning or evening. It, it doesn't, um, I would say the morning is best, but, um, you know, it's perfectly okay for, for someone to just practice at any time because you're going to get benefits regardless. Thank you. Um, I hope that answers your question. Alia Ji, sorry, I was just trying to look for the uh, Trini Foundation website, which I just found. So we're just going to share that with um, Koti Ji. Can you, I've, I've added that, can you please share it with all our participants, please? And also just to remind everyone that all of these sessions are recorded. So if you would like to come back to it later, listen to Taylor's lovely story again, or share it with people who you know that might need to hear the story, because sometimes you just need to hear a story to understand how it can impact your life. It's, you know, the talk is called, this is going to change everything. So I, I, I hope everyone who's watched, and there's the address, it's trinifoundation.org. So please get on it and see what we can do to help uh, Taylor and the amazing work that he's doing. I think we have another question also. How to show up every day? Um, yeah, so I, I get asked this a lot, um, how to show up every day. I think that you have to take the idea, um, if, you're, if you're like an Ashtanga person, I think you have to take the idea that you have to do the whole practice and throw it out and like kind of throw that away because it becomes overwhelming to people. And so like take that idea that you have to do the whole primary series or whole second or whatever, and just kind of toss it to the side right now. And in order for you to show up every day, a lot of times it needs to be more uh, digestible and smaller and more consistent before you add on more. And so like one of the philosophies of, of Mysore or Ashtanga yoga is that we really teach one pose at a time or small sections of the practice at a, at the time, at a time. And the reason why that's important is because like, as you open up hips and hamstrings and you get more sore and you're building strength, which is making you sore, um, it becomes harder to show up and not to mention like all the psychological things that are happening as a result of like feeling, feeling your body, feeling your feelings, all of these things that can happen with yoga as well. And so um, the best way to show up is to make sure that you're doing the practice that you should do instead of um, instead of the practice that's like 
you think you should be doing. Um, if you think that you're supposed to do, be doing all the primary series and you only do it one day a week, it probably makes more sense to do half of it or standing poses every single day instead of thinking you have to do this monumental task of an hour and a half of practice. So make it smaller, um, make the goal more obtainable, um, uh, you know, take the idea that you have to do the whole thing and throw it away. And you can come back to it after you've sort of built the muscle of discipline, because discipline is the only thing that's going to keep you consistent. And, you know, discipline is a muscle that you're trying to build just like your shoulder muscles or back muscles. I think that's great advice. And I think especially as Ashtanga practitioners, we need to hear that advice very often because that's what happens sometimes. Just the thought of going through, okay, I have to do that much can cause some kind of resistance. Whereas you approach the practice with, okay, I'm just going to get on the mat and let's see what happens. It's <clears throat> it's a lot more encouraging to get on the mat when you think like that. So um, I think that's it for questions. We haven't received any more, but of course, if any of you think of anything that you'd like to ask Taylor, you can always write to Matrini Foundation or get in touch with us and we'll forward everything to Taylor. Um, yeah, so any last advice or message you'd like to leave us with before we sign off? I mean, I, I shared a lot, but I think that maybe the uh, parting message is, is that, uh, you know, if you want something different, you have to do something different. And if you want to show up at, and like be of more service to people, like you really have to work on yourself and you got to work on the transformation, you got to show up to your practice. And, and as a result, what it does is it give you, gives you the experience and the ability to like help other people like achieve the exact same thing as what you're trying to work on. So. Thank you so much. I think that's great words of advice to end the session on. And again, to remind everyone, this is being recorded. It'll be available on the Indica Yoga YouTube channel, our uh, social media, as well as our website. So please, please share it with everyone you know. Taylor, thank you so much for taking the time to share your beautiful story with us and G for making sure everything runs smoothly. And I'll see all of you next week for our next Yoga Insights. Namaste. Thank you.